Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of AWP, the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you once again for joining us. We are back here today with another quarantine edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast. I am here with the entire crew. How you guys doing? That's good. Um, <laughs> I've seen four walls and I'm tired of seeing them. Oh, for a second, I thought that was a Chris Jericho reference. No. Well, then, hey, maybe you should just break the walls no, down. No, 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 no more. <laughs> we did this off air. We're not continuing this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, but in all honesty, how are you guys doing? Fantastic. Glorious. I swear if that's that? another pun... <laughs> It it wasn't, but uh, if you want to call me Bobby Roode, you can. How no. about how about Robert Roode? Nah, I I don't I don't do mustaches. Okay, how about Ravishing Robert Roode? How was that? I like that. We'll call you Triple R. <laughs> oh, how that would have worked! Oh, but I don't even see him on TV. Yeah. Weird. Anyway, so what what brings us in? What brings us in, Sean? Well, before we get to the uh, main portion of today's episode, I think we need to all just take a second to pay, to pay tribute to now the late, great Howard Finkel, who passed away just a few days ago. Um, I didn't actually know this, but the very first employee of the WWE, uh, the guy with the legendary voice, I believe he did the first... 30 WrestleManias consistently, so, some, something around there. Um, legendary voice, I think we all grew up uh, in one way or another hearing, you know, and new WWE champion, um, another one of the veterans, legends that we've come to love and know, gone. Uh, any sentiments, guys? It, it's sad. It's a sad day for, for wrestling fans Anytime something like this happens. Uh, so, rest in peace, Fink. If it's possible, if, you, if you're if you able to hear it, I turned it up as loud as I could. If you all can please be quiet for 40 seconds to toll 10 bells. Here we go. Hearing the man's voice announce like your favorite superstar or wrestler win a championship was always like the greatest thing to hear. And whether it's the past, present, it's just an unfortunate situation, but it's life. And, you know, hopefully uh, the condolences are being sent to his family. Hopefully the WWE is doing right by his family. Uh, we all know the history of how the the man in charge tends to do things the right way, the wrong way. But I don't want to bring that up because, again, it's not up to him. I just hope everyone around is doing the right thing. Yeah, very well said. Um, very, very quick note. You know, sometimes we look at package videos of, you know, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, it's sometimes heartbreaking when you sort of piece together the fact that, you know, um, a lot of the per, uh, participants from the first, you know, re a few WrestleManias, I think about 80 or 90 of them have unfortunately passed away. Um, you know, so it's 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 sad when you see that, that window of, you know, legendary wrestlers from yesteryear, uh, you know, they pass on and, you know, there's very few left. But um, unfortunately, Howard Finkel was, you know, he was fighting a battle, but, um, yeah, rest in peace, Howard Finkel. We'll miss you. Um, uh, moving on to uh, the task at hand today, 
Um, Kamish, if you want to introduce us, because I feel like you brought this up over text, um, and we kind of just started talking about it, and it kind of led us here. Okay, so everyone that's a fan of wrestling, everyone's done this. I, I don't care if you, if you're brand new to you know wrestling in regards to watching WWE, Ring of Honor, Impact, um, New Japan, or even AEW. Um, Everyone always has, like, oh, well, I think he's the greatest. He's the greatest. Like, I have a top four. Like, the Mount Rushmore idea. That you have an ideal four that are the greatest. Whether you're, like I said, you're a brand new fan or you've been a fan of wrestling for 40, 50, however long um, wrestling's been around. In regards to being able to watch it, being able to attend shows, or entertain the idea of it. And there was this thing that I caught, I think at first it was on Instagram, and then I found the YouTube video of it. Um, Jericho was on a podcast, and someone asked him, like, flat out, who's your Mount Rushmore for? And I introduced this to you guys, and, and, you, and I know, Sean, you thought at first, like, is he joking? Is he serious? Yeah. Right? That was, that was your first reaction. Yeah, yeah. And then when I told you the four and then I sent you guys the link, you're like, wow. Like it, it, it's kind of like a weird list. Um, so then I guess like the avalanche of the snowball started rolling down the hill. And we started talking about it like, oh, who would be your four? Because we've done like our own like what? Who would be your 10 or 15 wrestlers in your own company yeah. type of a list? Yeah. So, I think we've never really discussed to each other, like, who our Mount Rushmore is. We've discussed, like, who our favorites or top five or top ten are, but never, like, you immortalize these four no matter what. Yeah. So, which kind of brings us here. Um, uh, Let me just sort of uh, tell everybody how, you know, what the official rules are. So... Usually on the podcast, we're usually very flexible. You know, if we have a list going, we'll have, you know, the list and then we will maybe say honorary mentions or people who almost made the list. However, this time I myself made it a thing where we're only going to have four. There can only be four, no honorary mentions, no close, you know, no 4.5, no nothing like that. It's just four wrestlers that we have chosen. Uh, We have two lists here, one for the males, one for the females. We're going to go through them one by one. This list is strictly opinionated. Um, It is just our personal opinions. Um, You know, your definition of Mount Rushmore could differ from the next person. So it's just how you're feeling, whether it's you're going off of who was the greatest or who made the biggest impact or whatever that category is. It's completely up to you. But we each have two Mount Rushmores here. We're going to actually start off with the males. Um, Any volunteers? I'm down. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Okay. So, the way that I made my decision was that I uh, I looked at, at wrestlers, and this is this is how I dictated both. And I went, whose impact on either uh, pop culture or society, or in in uh, one cer- one situation, I guess more just the wrestling universe in general whose impact was felt the the greatest and so i'm gonna start i'm gonna start with uh with the nature boy rick flair okay so i got ricky up there then i have hulk hogan i have the rock and i have mr you can't see me john cena <laughs> wow and so the justification behind these is that you hear time and time again, and Rick is, is endlessly quoted across uh, across the, the industry. He's, he's been an inspiration to countless wrestlers, and, and some of that, sure, could, be, could, could just be promo fluff. 
Uh, but I, I, I believe that Rick, as, as a character, probably inspired a lot of these, these uh, people when, when they were growing up. Then you've got Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan, the ultimate face of wrestling in the 80s, 90s, 80s and 90s, mostly. Yeah. And he, uh, he I think, was kind of your first, your first real professional wrestler to branch out into other, other mediums with some degree of success because he, he was in, he had, I can't even remember, remember all of them. I should have, I should have looked it up, but he was in a handful of movies. Yeah. Um, everybody knows who Hulk Hogan is. Yeah. Um, you could throw up a, a, a generic picture of, a, of a, a little do-rag bandana that's red and yellow and people will know who you're referring to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you've got The Rock, who I think goes without saying, but I'm going to say because otherwise my segment's going to be really short. Uh, the, the Rock is, is your first mega star. Like, he transcends professional wrestling. But he was a major star in, like, well, he, he started out a little slow, then he went heel, and then he became what we know as The Rock nowadays. And then he branched out, he went to Hollywood, and then he brought eyes back when he, uh, when he came back for twice in a lifetime. <laughs> um, but The Rock is, is far and away my favorite wrestler ever because he was charismatic he was uh, he was talented um he showed what could what what could be and he wasn't a big guy like sure he was billed at what 275 for most of his most of his career roughly like six, yeah. five, six five two seven five yeah but he he wasn't he wasn't a big guy in relation to some of the other people. You had Triple H, you had Undertaker, you had Kane, Big Show, and he 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 looked small compared to those guys. Yeah. Um, but also, I'm gonna just throw this out there. He posted on Instagram the other day, and I don't know if you guys heard about this, but he uh, told an anecdote of how he his ego was getting out of control. Yeah. And one time this couple came up to him at a, I think it was a restaurant. Yes, correct. And they asked, they asked if they could take a picture with him and get his autograph. And apparently the way he said it, that because he said yeah, but the way he said it probably came across dismissive and the people seemed to then feel like they were impeding, like they were... Uh, imposing. They, yeah, like they were imposing. And so then he he made the realization that he has that power over people and that... Uh, his fame shouldn't give him the right, I guess, to make other people feel bad. Um, now, granted, there's obviously there's obviously situations like if somebody came up and said, "Hey, hey, you're the Rock. Take take a picture with me." Um, I would not I would not blame him if he said no. But if somebody comes up and they're real nice and they're expressing their gratitude and their fa- fandom for you and they just want they just want a second of your time, uh, he was saying, I mean, why not? If I can if I can take two seconds out of my day and make somebody else's day uh, better, uh, I I should be happy with that. But yeah, he, yeah he, he talked about how that that was a humbling experience, and that made me respect the the man that I already respect a, a ton more because it, it showed humility for somebody who's ludicrously uh, famous. Yes. And then obviously John Cena is more of the, the, he's the most recent example of this because he was the backbone and, and he got a bad rap there toward the end, but he was the backbone of WWE for a decade because they didn't have anybody else in his caliber, really, who you could build the company on or who you could uh, use as that primary merchandiser for kids. Yeah. Brand, like, like Randy, talented guy, not your Free Pebbles uh, product-toting professional wrestler. Um, Edge, good guy, talented, still not the face of your company type of person. Um, 
And so uh, that's why Cena, Cena closes out my, my Rushmore because I think between his impact for the last 15 years and the fact that he also has followed in The Rock's footsteps in a way where he's now transcended professional wrestling, he's shown that uh, wrestlers are more than just wrestlers, which I think is the bad, the bad rap that they had for a long time. Uh, I think that he, he gets uh, that fourth spot. Very, very well said. Very, very interesting. Kamesh, thoughts? Um, so, seeing your list, Dan, like, uh, like I, I can agree on all four of these in, in regards to, like, like, if you, look, if you look at this, yeah, if you look at this list, like, it, it, it ranges very generational as well. Yeah. Because you have, like, wrestlers on this list that it's like, they've inspired fans all across the board from like we'll say as far back as the late 70s to right now yeah and in all different ranges and like they all have brought people who are not even wrestling fans to watch them compete and that's kind of hard to pull off yeah and and obviously there's there's other Equally as as worthy names that I'm sure a couple of them snuck onto your guys' list. <laughs> but yeah, these were just the four that in thinking who had the broadest overall impact, even outside of wrestling. Who do I think it is? And it was these four. I will say this. Um, those names and some other names definitely made it to my uh, trying to narrow it down to four list. Um but uh, very, very fair argument for each and every one of those. I do agree, yes. But who's up next? I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in next for, for, for this. Um, so mine, I, I, I didn't look at it like that. I mean, I, I, I wanted to, but I kind of look at it more towards the whole back end of like the sport itself and the contributions that these four have made some have made pop culture, like, you know, like, influence as well. I don't think it's big as the four that Dan mentioned. So this is mine. Um, everyone knows this first one just because, like, obviously I've always thought he's the greatest. Uh, Shawn Michaels. Um, because I don't know if, like, if you guys... I know, Sean, you've seen the Ric Flair uh, Broken Skull session. Yeah. And there's a lot of wrestlers that say Sean is, like, the greatest in-ring performer. Yes. Of all time. And if you look at it, he adapts to whoever he's ever wrestled, whether it's Bret Hart, Triple H, Ric Flair, um, John Cena, and he's fit on classic matches. Not only just in pay per view settings, but like on Monday Night Raw um, matches. Like you can't tell me there's not a Monday Night Raw where you're like, "Oh, Shawn Michaels wrestled someone," and there's always something memorable about it. Yeah. So he he's on there for sure. Uh, this one I wrestled with because I was gonna put his name, but then I thought. You know what? He influenced this wrestler even more, and this guy has impacted the business a lot. Uh, Sting. Okay. Sting on my list because everyone recognizes, like old school wrestling fans will recognize. Okay, we got you know uh, the Venice, California, Beachbody, you know former Road Warrior, like big, strong, muscle guy, right? And he was the face of WCW at that time. But then even he knew he had to transition for the new generation. And then when he metamorphed himself into, you know, the Crow uh, character, it brought on a whole new aspect to him and to wrestling. Because it's like, all right, he took on an entire organization that wanted to revolutionize wrestling with the New World Order. And... They that that was your face of your 
of your one company against the WWE. And then, you know, with the whole buyout of WCW to McMahon and then him being the one, like, you know what? I'm not going to jump ship. I'm going to do what I need to do. And he made his impact literally in Impact TNA Wrestling. And I've always thought then when he finally made his transition to the WWE, it would still be as impactful as it was if he had done it back in 2001. Or hell, he could have done it in 2003. Waited a couple years like Goldberg did. Um, So that's my number two. Number three would be Triple H. Okay. Just because. Just, just because the the guy lives and breathes the sport, yeah, and he, he was he was definitely in consideration for me. And I put him on there because like he has transcended himself from like being literally a nobody to the biggest name in wrestling in regards to trying to bring in all this new talent with NXT and show that oh. You don't have to be fans of like the big guys, like like the Goldbergs or the Hulk Hogan's or like the Macho Man's or the Warriors or like even fans of like the Shawn Michaels, the Bret Hart's, the Owen Hart, and like guys like that. Like he he's brought us guys like you know like like Ricochet and you know the Shield. Yeah, he got a spin too, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Like he he's been able, and not just. Uh, wrestlers in America, like all over the world. Yeah, like granted, yeah, he's done his fair share throughout his career of like, oh no, I need to be the top guy, you know. But he's been able to pull off that heel, true villain character for so long, but also to give back to the sport that he loves. Yeah. Yeah, from, from terror, terror rising to uh, the second <laughs> of WWE. Like to pull that off, I mean, I'm just saying. And then for my last one, and I think, I don't know if you guys might find it interesting or not, but uh, my last one on Mount Rushmore is uh, Edge. Okay. <laughs> I put Edge up there because there was always something about him, like his first, I want to say, six years. Like you saw him as this true baby face, like, the, the guy you rooted for that, oh, he's going to be a, a good champion one day. You know, he's going to be the guy to, like, bring in this new generation of superstars in. And then you see him transform to the Raider or superstar. You're just like, wow, that is the true definition of, like, change, well, of, of good change. Like, he, he always gave, like, classic matches with, like, John Cena, you know, with Randy Orton. And I always thought, like, the fact that, like, Edge breathed the sport and that it was taken away from him, but he still manned up the courage nine years later, like, even if he was cleared to come back, that he could do it. And he could yeah. still keep going no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. I love Edge. Edge is another another good example, especially with the fact that he, like, he, he, he had a, a, a career built or that he was building anyway, outside of wrestling, because he couldn't wrestle, and he still made that decision, like you said, nine years later, to come back. So he he and he always talked about how much he loved it, and so then to see that in full full effect. But yeah, that that this is a uh, my Mount Rushmore of the uh, at least the men's side of the wrestling ring. Yeah, you know, very interesting. Um, dare I say, I think probably the 90s uh, onward is is kind of where that list sort of falls under. Um, you know, with Sting and Triple H and Michaels, obviously. Edge, you know, a little bit more of the 2010s, you know, New Millennium. Um, but no, yeah, very, very valid, uh, very valid candidates for, for each and every one. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll get started. Um, my Mount Rushmore, uh, this was a bit difficult, but, um, I think Dan, um, you, 
said it the best because um, when I was thinking about how do I want to base my list or what, are, what do I want to base it off of, um, I thought of impact, not the company, but like literal impact on the business. Um, you know, who facilitated the most change? Who facilitated, you know, uh, who broke the mold? Who took things to a, to a whole new level? So with that said... Um, my first candidate or my first person on my Mount Rushmore here, which I don't think is going to come as a shocker to anybody, um, Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, this guy, uh, I know for some of your guys' uh, wrestlers as well, you guys said, you know, came from nothing and just, you know, by the time he was done, you know, everybody knew who he was. Um, this guy, you know, yeah, there was a lot of people who sort of, you know, were a player in it. But in my mind, this guy was the leader of the Attitude Era. Um, you know, this guy, even Vince McMahon has gone on record to say, you know, Austin, if there was ever a, a record that needed to be broken, he literally shattered it. You know, from t-shirts to merch to pay-per-view buy rates, you know, to raw ratings. If Austin was on, you, 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 you would tune in because... Dare I say he was probably the most interesting segment of the whole show. Um, very, very believable. I think, you know, probably the only wrestler who can really get my adrenaline going, even if he's just, you know, walking down the ramp, you know, with that strut and, and you know, the music is hitting in the background. Austin, to me, just, he's the guy, you know, who really inspired me. Like, on, on a personal note here... He inspired me, you know, to really stand up for myself that if something doesn't work for you, you know, use your voice. Obviously, don't go around stunning everybody because you can get into trouble. But, you know, stand up for yourself if something doesn't work for you. So Austin, to me, you know, um, yeah, has he done a few wrong things in his career? Yes, he has. But overall, I think he's left a big impact on wrestling um, and my favorite wrestler, obviously. So I had to put him on here. Um, I, I, I want to chime in on him for one second. Actually. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, Stone, Stone Cold, major player. Like I said, other people that deserve to be on the list that I figured you guys would pick up, and that he's one of them. Um, the funny thing that I want to say is that I don't know if it was the same for you guys, but I also came from uh, a, a tiny-ass little little town in, in Michigan. Uh, and so people who were fans of uh, professional wrestling – there was this connotation that they were that they were all rednecks, and I would almost say Stone Cold Steve Austin is probably the reason that that uh, perception uh, even existed. But uh, I think that people uh, across the world appreciate him for what he what he is uh, more more than just the the the, the redneck uh, <laughs> nowadays. I mean, if I could add this in. Yeah. You have to understand, like, Austin was dead close to narrowing into my list as well. There isn't any aspect of pop culture, like, culture at all, that you don't recognize that glass breaking. And you're like, holy shit, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin. They, they even referenced him on The Good Place. Kristen Bell dropped a, dropped a handful of Stone Cold Steve Austin references. Like, you can... <laughs> Turn like turn that uh, intro on and like oh shit you already know who it is to have that impact in anything whether it's like sports or pop culture or whatever like you know it's him and to to leave that impact in the world that's pretty big coming from a guy who Eric Bischoff thought oh he's never gonna sell out arenas he's never gonna be big in this industry. That's a major impact that he has. But well, Austin three sixteen says he just proved him wrong. <laughs> um, I will just throw this in there. Going back to your point, uh, Kamish, for a second, uh, it's really amazing when you cannot be a full time wrestler and you can have that glass break and you can get, dare I say, um, the biggest pop in the history of the business, even being gone and not having a full-time schedule because we see it all the time. Anytime Austin makes an appearance, that when that glass shatters, he gets the biggest pop, in my personal opinion, um, of that night, or any night for that matter. Um, 
With that said, I'm going to move on to the second person on my Mount Rushmore. Um, Dan, I think you're going to really appreciate this one. The Rock. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Rock, to me, um, for a long time, was very much equal with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I'm talking in every single aspect. Um, the Rock, once again, going back to your point, Dan, came from kind of being nobody uh, to being the most hated guy in the building, and not in a good way, but in a really bad way. We all remember the die, Rocky die, or the Rocky sucks chance. Um, and The Rock just took that, and he just, he ran with it. Um, and he became the biggest star in the company. Um, the Rock, to me, is someone that can get anything over. When you really think about his gimmick, you have an eyebrow raise, which is probably one of the most generic things you can do on your face, is just raise an eyebrow. You can get anything over except for Roman Reigns. (laughs) (laughs) I thought of that just now. (laughs) If you guys don't know what he's talking about, you can catch the Royal Rumble 2015 only on the WWE Network for a non-negotiable but very reasonable price of just only... Nine ninety nine. Um, but yeah, you know, you you think about things like um, uh, an elbow drop with theatrics, aka the people's elbow. Small things, he got it over. He could call you the number six, and for the rest of your life, people will be calling you the number six. Um, CLB STD. <laughs> just to name a few. Um. But I think, again, sorry, Dan, I feel like I'm, I'm leeching off of each and every one of your facts, but they do sort of coincide with what I was thinking yesterday as I was thinking about this. The Rock, more than anything, especially now, with the success in WWE, with the success in Hollywood, um, I think he's become a role model, really. Um, for someone to have that much fame as he does... And to be so humble about it and to be so down to earth and help out the community as much as he has. Um, it is such a riveting and, 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 a, and a moving thing. Um, to me, The Rock, like, the guy is a hero to me. He really, really is. Both inside and outside of the ring. Um, and I think that he truly broke that mold of, oh, all these wrestlers can do is have probably, you know, a few years in the ring And that's it. They really can't do anything after that. And I think that The Rock was the first person really who went to Hollywood, had a few bad movies in the beginning there, but then you had the walking talls and the rundowns and and all this stuff kind of begin. Very, very, you know, successful movie career. Um, I still love The Scorpion King. I don't care what anybody says. (laughs) Um, and I think he's one of the few superstars who was on top of the company and did an excellent job of being both a face and a heel. You know, you kind of go back to Hollywood rock back in 2002, 2003. He, he took that thing and he ran with it, you know, showing everybody that, yes, I can be the most cheered guy in the building, but I can make you hate me within the, you know, within the snap of my fingers. Um... Yeah, I mean, The Rock, you know, everybody knows who The Rock is, you know, whether they know him from acting or wrestling or whatever, everybody knows in some form, you know, uh, who The Rock is. So, he, you know, he's he's definitely on my Mount Rushmore for sure. Um, But here's another another thing, too. Like, you can be someone who's literally created a phrase that has now been put into the English dictionary in in regards to the word SmackDown. Yeah. <laughs> like, who does that? And then on top of that, like, who makes movies like freaking Tooth Fairy and Pain and Gain to, like, Hobbs and Shaw, Moana, and, and the Fast and Furious series and just, and still be, like, that amazing, you know? The, the man's got range. Yeah, I, I oh. think that comes from him not being afraid to just put himself out there, you know? Because, let's be honest, in wrestling... Um, you're bound to have a segment or two where people are, you know, you're going to become the butt of the joke, so to speak. Um, and I think that The Rock, you know, when he was offered the Tooth Fairy and, and roles like that, I think he just ran with it because, you know, he's not afraid to put himself out there. He's not afraid to, you know, for someone to point at him and go, ha, hey, you played in the Tooth Fairy, you know? I mean, he can take it. Um, and I think it goes back to that well, video. Well, I, 
I'm sure if, if somebody started making fun of the the fact that he did the, the, the tooth fairy, he'd be like, yeah, my bank account's not laughing. <laughs> exactly. That fair <laughs> Yeah, very, very. I I think the most highest paid actor in Hollywood is that correct? Uh, he he has been a couple of years. I don't know if he was this past year, but yeah, he makes a he makes uh, for lack of a better term a uh, shit ton of money. Yeah, and for him to be <laughs> humble as much as he is, it's it's truly amazing. You 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 don't get that in every single athlete or actor or whatnot. So yeah, that that's that. Um. A third one, and I think that the both of you will... It's going to be one of those, yeah, of course you put him on there moment. Um, the Undertaker. Bizarro. Uh, well, yeah, he was considered, but... <laughs> um, and he might be the fourth man. I don't know. Who's the fourth man? Um, but in all seriousness, um, The Undertaker. You think... I think when you think to, okay, who has been the most loyal to their character... Who has made it the most believable? Who has believed in their character more than anybody else? I think The Undertaker has to be at the top of your list. Um, this guy constantly evolved. Um, many people now say, hey, you know what? That American badass thing, that didn't work. I don't think it worked. No, he made a big mistake. Um, and there is stuff like the Boneyard match where it's like, well, why don't you go back and take a look and, you know... Uh, it's like it, it it's it's a fair rebuttal against people who say that. Um the Undertaker to me, I don't know, the guy just from every single aspect you think about it, you know, you hear it in interviews all the time that he was the leader, you know, when there used to be a wrestler's court that he was, you know, the judge. Um, you know, if anybody dared to get out of line in the locker room, the Undertaker would set him straight. Um just overall, I think, you know, very humble guy. Um, you know, not afraid to put, you know, uh, others over, um, not afraid to experiment, you know, with who he is and, you know, the gimmick, um, you know, again, the fact that he's evolved constantly, the most believable, um, you know, once again, another guy who the most simplest thing as walking to the ring very slowly and just allowing for his opponent to, you know, to get into the mindset of, you know, oh shit, you know, what have I gotten myself into type of thing. Um, just overall, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I admit it. There comes to a point where it's like, okay, he really needs to retire because he can, he can't do it as well as he used to. But it's almost like, this is just me personally speaking. It's almost like, no, I don't want him to retire because there can only ever be one undertaker. There have been so many attempts to replicate it to try to bring a, a 2.0, but there can only be one, you know? And I think one of his shirts said it best where it said, um, always imitated will never be replicated. And I think that just tells you, you know? Like, the guy knows, like, yeah, it's it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. For the gimmick to be a part of what Bruce Pritchard always calls, you know, the era where it was a box of gimmicks, I think this is the only one that has been successful and it has gone on for as long as it has gone on so uh for that reason the undertaker you know had to be on my mount rushmore so to, to add in with the undertaker he, he was a really good consideration as well to mine the guy has cultural impact as well i mean like people know him as the dead man people know him as like you know um like this brood evil force that like you know you were like holy shit like i'm terrified of this guy and even now as like you see like the more human side to him of, of like you know obviously more callaway like you still find that respect like oh yeah no we know that's more callaway but really that, that that's the undertaker yeah that, that's that's him you know and i mean he may not have done as much you know as far as like you know, movies and, and TV, but he has done some things Yeah, that, like, I've, I've kind of found out about. And it's like, oh, well, he can branch out outside of the WWE as well, but he does have, like, that impact inside and outside of the WWE. Yeah, um, if I can make a fair argument, I think the reason why Undertaker 
chose not to participate in as many movies or TV shows, I think he was always trying to maintain the gimmick and be very loyal to it. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, for, for, for that reason, I mean, you know, the guy had to be on my list. So, um, coming down to the last guy on my list here, um, after very much deliberation with this wrestler and another one, I finally had to go with this out of the two Hulk Hogan. Um, you know, I, I, I forget where it was or who said it, but Hulk Hogan put the WWF, now WWE, on the map. And I know most people will maybe argue against that and go, no, I don't think so. I think it was a group effort. Honestly, in my personal opinion, Hulk Hogan in the 1980s, right around that time where WrestleMania was going to take place, the very first WrestleMania... Hulk Hogan is the reason why the WWF was so big. To go back to your point, Dan, very, very easily recognizable. Horseshoe mustache, red and yellow bandana, um, very recognizable. Um, and, I mean, you know, you want to talk about a guy who, you know, we always talk about it. You know, there are some top superstars who... You know, they're a face, but if they turn turn heel, that's probably not going to work. No, let's not do that. Um, dare I say w one of the more successful heel turns in history would have to be Hulk Hogan. Um, going from the red and yellow to the black and white, you know, Hollywood, being the leader of the NWO, um, ironically coming back to the WWE in his match with The Rock, he's supposed to be the bad guy. The guy is getting cheered. You know, The Rock is getting booed out of the building. And these two are almost immediately forced to switch places and, you know, tell a different story. Which I think goes to tell you, you know, that, that the people know, hey, you know what? You can try to shove down our throats that Hulk Hogan is supposed to be a bad guy. But that's freaking Hulk Hogan. That's red and yellow Hulk Hogan. Um, and I think to me personally, red and yellow Hulk Hogan is always the more favorable than the black and white. But um, I think that before there was a John Cena breaking records, before there was a Steve Austin breaking records, Hulk Hogan was that guy. Uh, you know, rock and wrestling, you know, cartoons, movies, TV shows, you name it, Hulkster was on, was on the forefront of it. I truly believe the guy put wrestling on the map um, very first guy to really introduce fan interaction, you know, when he would do the Hulk, the hulking up, he would look to the audience. Um, we talk about, you know, the most generic of things getting over a guy that, you know, becomes wide eyed, looks at the crowd, rips off his shirt and gets the whole, you know, crowd, you know, cheering, you know, out of their boots, out of their seats. That's when, you know, you've done something. Um, so for that reason, Hulk Hogan to me um, has to be in the conversation for sure. Yes, there is a lot of black marks on his career. He's maybe said a thing or two that he shouldn't have. He's maybe done a thing or two that he shouldn't have. But I honestly believe that at least for right now, Hulk Hogan means well. I know that he's buried the hatchet with a lot of the guys that he had problems with. He's been able to put all that behind him. Um... But honestly, Hulk Hogan to me needs to be in the conversation if you're talking about wrestling. So for that reason, he completes my Mount Rushmore. Oh, good choices. I like them. I, I, I can... These are all good choices that you guys have. Like, I, I can say, like, you know, I, like Hulk Hogan was a deep, deep consideration, like, in regards to, like, Sting's spot. But, like, it... Again, that's my choice. And, but I still, I love your guys' picks. Yeah, I got to say, it was so difficult choosing between Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair because when you kind of think about it, those two like go together like Austin and The Rock. So trying to choose one over the other was extremely difficult. But ultimately, I, I had to go with Hogan. Um, so yeah, now that we got the first half of it complete, let's move on to the female. So our respective Mount Rushmore's for the females. I'd say let's go with the same order that we did for the first one. So, Dan, why don't you tell us what this list is based off of um, and who your picks are for your Mount Rushmore. All right. So, mine, I, I looked at it in a similar way to the men's list. But obviously, 
with all due respect to the ladies, most of them have not had nearly the same cultural impact as the as the men have. Yeah. Um. So they're going to be a bit more a bit more contained overall to the wrestling world, uh, with some variation because. You, you, when I start saying the names, you guys will recognize how some of them have, uh, again, to keep going back to this word, transcended professional wrestling. Uh, but So the first one that I went with is because she was a long-standing staple in the company, even though she was a thousand years old. She's got a, a tournament named after her at this point, uh, but I put good old Mae Young uh, okay. up there. So May, May Young is my my number one, and that's the 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 face to represent where we came from, what kind of started it all. Because she she's a big name for old school women's wrestling. Okay. And then next, uh, I went with uh, China. Okay. Because China, as far as China, kind of opened the door for female exposure um because granted she was she was she was a big muscular woman and she was paired off most frequently with the men but she was not your your stereotypical prissy valet diva she was in there she was roughing roughing around with the with the guys and she, she showed that women could be more than eye candy yeah um so, at that point, then, I transition over to uh, the name I think everybody expects to be on this list also, and that's Trish Stratus. Yes. Who, who is one of the, the most prominent women in WWE history because of the fact that she kind of started off inconsequential. <laughs> she, she was just pretty. She was just, just a valet. And she became one of, one of the most decorated female uh, champions of all time. Uh, she's the reason that I'm. She's the reason I've caught flack for uh, saying no. Give Lana a chance to wrestle. She might get good. <laughs> because I, I think that the more you work. Um, the, the better you'll get, and if you're being uh, if you're being restricted, you're never going to get there. So if you, if people like Lana, like Liv Morgan, aren't being given opportunities, you'll never really get an opportunity to see what they could be. Yes, and Trish is a perfect example of what could be and what what came to be. And so then my fourth one is uh, Kayla Braxton, because why wouldn't you want to immortalize that face in stone? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Number four is uh, the man, Becky Lynch. Okay. Uh, because I think that she is the most recent example. And it's, she's more, she's, she's kind of, I hate to say it, she's kind of a bookmark because there's still potential uh, for her to not have the same long-term impact as these other people. But I also didn't want to give it to Charlotte. <laughs> mm. um, but so, no, I mean, Becky, again, is somebody who started out as sort of this quirky, the quirky little Irish lass down in NXT doing the, the, the Michael Flatley Lord of the Dance BS. And... Over the over the years, she developed and she grew and she worked on her craft and she got better. And she's pretty good at cutting a promo. And she's shown that if you're given time, if you're given, uh, if people put their their trust in you, you can take something. Which in several of her interviews, she said they didn't believe that I was going to be anything. And she took it and she she took the the ball and, and ran with it. Because then we saw her develop into this persona. We saw her get the natural Daniel Bryan type of uh, fan support. And that ultimately led to the whole program with uh, Rhonda and, and, and Charlotte. 
and and that's where we're at now. We've had Becky holding the Raw Women's Championship for over a year at this point, and uh, I, I I still would love to see more character development from her, but. She she's the most obvious person from an overall historic standpoint that I I could I could pick for this spot. Um, very very solid. I do agree with each and every one. Um, and obviously each and every one you know comes from a different decade. Um, but yeah, no, very very solid in Mount Rushmore. Commission, any thoughts? Especially, especially Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like it. It's a good. It's a great list. It's almost damn near close to mine. And mine. Um, but, but um, I'm gonna call a name off mine. Um, actually, the the first would be uh, Trish Stratus, just because. To your point, yeah, she pretty face but see what she can do if given more time but also she transitioned the whole thing of you don't only have to be a valet you don't only yeah. have to be eye candy you 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 can also be a badass you can also like prove that you're more than just like there for like the entertainment value you're there in the company to show off that you have wrestling talent, that you can develop the talent and become a good and successful uh, superstar as well. Yeah. So that that's for me with Trish. Uh, number two would be uh, AJ, AJ Lee. Ah. Um, I mean, you have, again, the more current transition of like, valet to GM to superstar. And I always liked a little bit of the crazy. <laughs> I, I know what it is. And, and the fact that, I mean, granted, you know, her husband has done his impact in wrestling, but he makes more of like a top 10 list than a Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that might be because he, he didn't get, he didn't get to get the chance yeah. Before yeah. he got himself, before he got himself burned out. Yes. And I could think too, like if AJ never got hurt, what would her impact be right now? Yeah. If she decided, like you know what, if uh, Bill's okay with me continuing to work for the company, you know, could I have become a Raw Women's Champion? Could I have become a SmackDown Champion or a Tag? team champion with either Paige or whoever I wanted my partner to be. Yeah, and a- a- AJ, again, like you kind of glossed, glossed over, very versatile, very very adaptable, and she she's a, a great example of, she she's the person you want your fan base to look at and aspire to be because of the fact that she was so, she was so open about being one of them. She was Bailey before Bailey. Yeah. Um, and I I loved AJ. I thought she was very talented. Plus, she gave uh, my girl Paige her first uh, Divas Championship. So uh, yeah, no, good pick. And then uh, my third pick, of course, is China. Just because, again, you got someone who was first looked at like, oh, you know, she's not really. A girly girl. She's more like a manly girl, like a tyke or whatever. Like you, that, that whole like negative annota- connotation towards her like sucked, but she still proved everyone wrong. She still proved like you know what? I'm strong like the men, and I can go toe to toe with them, but I can hang with anybody that you put in front of me. I mean, yeah, she didn't have the greatest in competition because she could just crush right through all of them. At the time, but if 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 she had kept herself in a position where you know she was still respected in the business, she didn't do some of the things she did, and she didn't get screwed over the way she did. I think China could have left an even bigger impact in the women's division overall. Yeah, the history. 
if if we if she would have been able to stick around and and she she hadn't gotten smeared and and cast aside, uh, if we could have gotten to see a, a China versus Beth Phoenix match at yes. some point, that would have been a hell of a thing. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I mean, Kong. Uh, sorry, Karma was only there for a minute, but even that. Um, J- I, Jazz, I think, was a, yeah. was a pretty beefy woman who uh, she could have faced off with. There, there was a lot of potential for for really nice pairings that we just never got to see. Yeah, and and we could have seen all that. Granted, if things would have gone differently in history. But so China also left their impact outside of uh, the WWE at one point, whether positive or negative, however you guys want to take it. And then, um, of course, my my fourth one is is, is the same as Dan's. It's uh, Becky, um, because I think there's still potential to change her character in a way. Like he can still take this whole thing of the man and turn it into a good heel point as well. Like not. Almost similar to her fiance to be in Seth, but in that egotistical demeanor at one point. Well, it's because she's know? got she's got that flavor of Austin in there, and and Austin was able to fl- to change on 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 a dime, and uh, she's got I think she's got that same capacity, and I think she's beloved enough and uh, has enough of the respect of the fan base. That if Becky were to turn heel, she would be like the fiend in that the fans love her regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't want to see her come up with some type of similar gimmick to Austin where we just get a one word chant out of the whole audience. Well, when we get an audience back, like I wouldn't want her to do the whole what type of thing, you know? And that's one of those things that I think Vince needs to not be in charge of if we're not gonna if if we're gonna avoid that. Please. Well, it worked for Steve. Yeah, but um, no, that that would be my Mount Rushmore of the female division and Trish, AJ, China, and Becky. I dig it. Um, gotta warn you guys, there's gonna be a lot of intersecting going on here because uh, my list is. Basically the same. Um, so my Mount Rushmore of the females. Once again, I went off of, you know, stuff such as leaving an impact, being a role model, being successful, um, or at least those who were given a chance, because as we just talked about, a lot of them weren't given a chance or enough chances to improve and become, you know, a draw. Um, first name, obviously, that came to mind uh, was Tris Stratus. Um, I think... She put the women's division on the map in the very early millennium, um, you know, uh, when China was the champion and there was some controversy surrounding that. So she gets stripped of the title, leaves the company. Hey, there's no champion. So they have this um, six pack challenge. Trish, they just they decide to go with Trish Stratus and she just takes that belt and runs with it. Um I think, again, she kind of broke that mold of, hey, if you're blonde and, you know, you got good looks and you come from a modeling career, you don't just have to stand there and look pretty and, you know, collect that paycheck. Um, Kelly, Kelly. (laughs) um, Among others. But uh, I think, again, it goes back to what you guys were saying. She was constantly given a chance. Okay, well, you're here. Okay, let's turn you baby face. Let's turn you heel. Let's try to do this. Let's try to do that. Um... You know, when it came time for her to be adored, she was adored by the fans. When it came time for her to be a heel, she was a word that I will not repeat, but you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys know what I'm saying. That Um, storyline with her and Jericho and Christian is still one that I'm really fond of personally. Yeah, one that really... Oh, oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, it had a structure. I think it had a payoff, a, a little twist at the end. Um, but I think Trish, once again, I sort of look at her as the rock in a way, because someone who has had success and I don't think there's any record or there's anybody in a particular interview who will tell you, oh yeah, you know what? Trish Stratus did me wrong or, you know, she robbed me of this or she buried me or she, you know, did something very personal that was bad or, you know, like she, she has a very, very good reputation inside and outside of the ring. 
Um, you know, and I think that's very, very respectable. So definitely she had to be on my list for that. Um, as, as my, my second, uh, you know, female wrestler on my Mount Rushmore. And I was actually shocked that none of you had it on yours. But again, it's, this is a opinionated Lita. Um, Lita to me was, she was, a, she, was she was definitely considered. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Um, Lita, to me, was uh, the counterpart to Trish Stratus. Um, Lita, I think, broke that mold of, oh, we have to be grounded. You know, we just have to do generic moves. We have to just, you know, try to maintain, you know, the, the, the match inside the ring, you know, on the canvas. Um, Lita started leaping off the top rope like it was nobody's business, you know, doing huracaranas and moonsaults and, you know, wasn't afraid to, you know, uh, get 3 d to by the Dudleys, you know, so... Um, you know, and again, you know, she wasn't blonde, you know, she was, she, she didn't come from that, you know, modeling career. Um, she embraced who she was and, you know, she had her own personal, you know, way of dressing up and, you know, uh, you know, expressing herself and also, you know, being, you know, a part of Team Extreme wasn't afraid to, you know, um, you know, get, get, go through a table or, you know. Uh, you know. or, or bring her personal life into a storyline. Here we go. That's um, the only knock on mind of why she didn't make my list. That, well, that maybe we can. Only bad thing. Maybe we can talk about that sometime. But you know, don't don't get me wrong. As, as a as a fan and as a uh, prepubescent boy of the era, uh, I um, I like Lita more than I like Trish. From a personal standpoint, but wow. uh, looking at this objectively and and deciding who best fits the Mount Rushmore mold, that uh, Trish got the edge on this one. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I mean, I, I'm in the same boat with that. It's just you know, she does have more of the lore. She does have more of the ring value to her that she took more risks yeah. as a performer. Yeah, which also 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 caused her some problems uh, over over the time. Yeah, yeah, that, and and that was the thing too that it's like a career that got shortened due to the risks she took. Yeah, so but don't get me wrong, I, I love I love Lita also. So good pick. Yeah. Same um, third uh, female wrestler. Both of you guys mentioned her. Um, China, China to me exemplifies starting a revolution before there was a revolution. Um, someone who just was built, was jacked, um, wasn't afraid to take a beating, but wasn't afraid to dish one out. Um, and I think that had she had the controversies and the rough outing not happened, I, th- I could have seen her being the dominant force of the women's division for a few more years to come. Um, I, I personally think she needs to be in the hall of fame and no, I don't count the, you know, the one with DX. She needs to have her own individual single rightful place in the hall of fame because all these, you know, today's female wrestlers, your Becky Lynch's, your Rhea Ripley's, your Sasha Banks's, your Bailey's, you know, every single one of them, you know, they talk about, you know, trying to outdo the guys. And to me, China would almost do that at times, where if she was in the ring, she wasn't there for a two-minute scuffle and then, you know, head back to the ring like she was a talking point for the show. Um, And again, through time, she evolved, you know, where at first she was, you know, the fierce, you know, um, deadpan stare, you know, manager for, you know, Helmsley. And then she kind of had a little bit more character with, you know, Mark Henry and Eddie Guerrero. Um, obviously went on to win the championship at WrestleMania, but then as we discussed, things came up and it wasn't such a good outing. But again, she's one of those people where for people who haven't watched wrestling in over 20 years, you could say China and people will know exactly who you're talking about. Um, now, now before you go into number four, Sean, yeah, those are, those are good picks. So my, my, my thought process here is. Uh, who 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 would you pick for your fourth entry, and 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 why Ronda Rousey? (laughs) 
Boom goes the dynamite. Oh, <laughs> uh, I almost did it at the beginning of your segment, but then I felt like this was better. <laughs> That's so horrible. Okay, once we wrap up the episode, I no longer know you, Dan. He's kidding. Just go. Just um, the who's the fourth woman? Who's the fourth who's woman? The fourth man? Um, this fourth one, I really had to give some thought. And I was juggling once again between her and someone that the both of you have on your list. But I eventually had to go with AJ Lee. Um, AJ, to me, right before this women's revolution took off, um, AJ was someone who, I don't know, every time she was on the screen, I was hooked. I was paying attention to what she was doing, what she was saying, who she was against, who were her allies, who were her enemies. Um, and I think, I mean, in record time, I want to say in a year and a half, she went from being a valet to being a GM to being an in-ring competitor to being women's champion. Um, and she was the most relevant out of the entire roster of that time. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of divas at the time whom you can really talk about other than AJ. And to go back to your guys' point, she once again broke that mold of, um, you know, I'm not blonde, I'm not, you know, a model, I don't come from a career like that, you know, uh, I come from a life of, you know, uh, being a loner and, you know, sleeping in cars and, you know, um, embracing who I am and going through all the, you know, um, you know, the, the bipolar disorder and, you know, uh, raising, you know, um, awareness for mental health. Um, I think that she did a good job of embracing who she was. And I, and I, I don't think it was just a storyline. I think it, you know, it, it's, it's actually her, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, and I'm, I'm going to let one slip here, but apparently, as, you know, she was trying to be considered if she was going to, you know, be a part of, you know, FCW at the time, or if she was going to get a chance to be on NXT, someone looked at her in the face and said, yeah, you're not fuckable enough. Um, and I think that just goes to show you, like, what the perception was back then. Hey, you know, do you look good? Are these guys in love with you? Oh, they are? Okay, yeah, you'll get the push. But I think she was the first one really had to stand up for herself and go, no, that's not who I am. That's not who I choose to be. And I think that her pipe bomb that she gave on the Total Divas exemplifies just that. Um, again, I, I think due to controversy with CM Punk and everything that happened, I guess, you know, she felt like it really wasn't her place to be. But... You even hear it now, you know, when a Royal Rumble comes around, people go, oh, I hope AJ Lee's in it. I hope she comes back. I hope she returns. Um, so for those reasons, um, AJ Lee, uh, what, you know, made my Mount Rushmore just for that. And I will throw this in uh, before I allow for you guys to comment. Becky Lynch was a very close, uh, was very close to, to being the fourth one. But I got to be honest with you guys. I just felt like her man, like the man run, the fire for that has been extinguished. Uh, at least most of it. Um, not that Mick, Becky's not capable of, you know, allowing for that fire to, to take over. But I just think it's, you know, being held back. The two, the back-to-back -back WrestleMania things that happened with her. Um, it's not her fault. But for, the reason, for, for that particular reason, Becky... Didn't unfortunately make my list, but that's my list. And, and that's that's fair. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take a jab at you for that. I'm not gonna say how dare you not pick her because no, that that's absolutely a valid statement because uh, the the whole thing here is that like for this WrestleMania, I even even being a big fan of hers and, and having her on my my Rushmore. I was prepared for her to lose the title to Shayna because I think that that's the next natural story for her character, and I think that's how we're going to see the next evolution. Yeah. I I don't want to say I don't enjoy or uh, um I don't know I, I don't want to say I don't enjoy having her as the face of the division and the champion. However, I think that these long title runs have a shelf life. Um. 
you don't want a title run that's only a week or a month, but you also don't need one that's a year and a half. I, I think that that stunts your storytelling more often than it doesn't. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw this in there, and, and it kind of goes with Dan's point, but also to kind of take some heat off of someone Sean's not really okay with right now. She would have gone on a Mount Rushmore if she had, if they had done this with her. Regardless if she's the daughter of one of the honorables of, on the mountain, I think it was Dan's. Yes. If you subtract, I'm going to say six title runs of hers. And you only, and you had made her a five time champion as of right now, regardless of how long her career is. And you gave her the year plus title run. I would think that would make more sense in her regard because I would too was also prepared for whatever the outcome was with Becky, whether she won it and continued or she immediately lost to Shayna. I think that would have made more sense in the regard because again, you can eventually evolve Becky's character out of this whole I'm the man thing at this point. Because that'll be a staple in Becky's career that people are going to remember her by, regardless if you forget it. Because people for, have long forgotten Austin 316 as far as like in his career, but they still know him for that to this day. That yeah. was my point. Yeah. And I mean, point taken, you know, but I just feel like, ironically, right after Becky won the Rumble is when that fire started, you know, sort of, you know, drizzling out or fading out because, um, dare I make this comparison, but I looked at it as almost like the summer of punk where, okay, we're rolling. We got a good few weeks of, you know, programming, but then all of a sudden you have all these other components that get added in. You know, like, we, the match that we all wanted to see was Becky versus Ronda. That's the match we wanted to see. Not Becky. That's, that's not even what we were going to get up to that point. Yeah. But we would have liked to see it. And I mean, when you have a semi-botched finish at last year's Mania, when you have an only eight-minute match at this year's Mania, it's not Becky's fault, but it's like, okay, that's kind of downgrading... Like, for the moments where you're supposed to look at it as a highlight, it becomes a demotion, you know? But, but let, let, me, let me draw th- these comparisons real quick, because it, it, it's happened time and time again, and last year's WrestleMania was the perfect time, and that's what would have catapulted her forward, and that's not what we got. You look back at Stevie Richards from 20, and Daniel Bryan at 30, and the, the stories of overcoming adversity and then getting in there with that natural fan support and then you get that big uh that big submission finish or did brian brian won with the labelle didn't he or with the knee yes labelle or yes lock at the time yeah he tapped he tapped him yeah you 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 get that big submission win and that's what catapults that's what we always talk about with wrestlemania is intended to end end a story it, it's your culmination. Daniel Bryan reaches the top. Stevie reaches the top. Becky reaches the top. But she, I, 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 I know what you were talking about, and I think that she, um, to the bad booking, the bad version of what would have been Daniel Bryan, because Bryan was the same thing. WWE was like, shut, fans, shut up. We don't want him there. And they, the fans just kept going, kept going, and finally they said, okay, screw it, and they, they put him in. And they pulled the trigger, and we got that magic moment. And they kind of did the same thing with Becky, where we got that really cool moment at the at, at the Royal Rumble where she came out, and she's like, put me in, and they're like, okay, fine, and she wins. But then they were still on the fence, I think, all the way up to it, where they were still like, god damn it, we just wanted Ronda and Charlotte. <laughs> well, I didn't. I mean, when but you... I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a company standpoint, so I don't. Think oh yeah, no, I know, but from a fan standpoint, I did. So I don't think that they were, for lack of a better term, all in 
on committing to Becky up to that point. And then when we got to Mania and we got that shitty uh, botched roll up, it took all the it took took the wind out of the whole thing. And I think that's why she's been suffering. Um, which is why Luke dropping the belt to Shayna at this year's Mania would have been better for her character. And I'm sorry, I, I know we're sort of getting away from the topic of Mount Rushmore, um, but to add on to that, Dan, for just one second, you kind of have a botched finish, and then you allow for her to feud with someone who wasn't ready at the time, Lacey Evans, um, yeah. and then in between, you would, you would sprinkle in, oh, let's have Becky versus Charlotte for the 1,286th time. You know, it just and and I think the the next point where her her character her title run was relevant was with Oscar, which I mean they did a good job of, and then with Shayna we were expecting this grueling match, and all we got was this eight minute match with a finish that we've seen probably about five times before, and it just it it doesn't it doesn't give you you know. Uh, Imagine like seeing The Rock and Hogan at Mania, and The Rock wins by DQ. It's like, wait, what? You know, like it, you at WrestleMania, you're supposed to have that that impactful finish. But then when you start doing what they started doing with Becky, it's like in in conversation, like it's like, yeah, I want to put her on the Mount Rushmore, but because of booking and circumstance, I can't really pull the trigger on that. You know? Wait, wait, wait. well, okay. I don't. Let's not deter from the fact that this is just a Mount Rushmore because we're we're slowly heading into a new conversation about what if and what to do with Becky now. But to kind of bring up your point, if we did have like a DQ finish to Hogan Rock, you could have swung it into many different perspectives to make it like, oh, could I have beat? The Rock, or I beat Hulk Hogan, you know, but we can't get that because no one can pull the trigger right right now with uh, Shayna and Becky. Because I'm assuming, and I'm just gonna put my eggs in the basket right now. I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna say that Shayna wins the Money in the Bank, and she's gonna cash in in June. Well, if they're allowed to film in June. And she's going to win the belt that way. They're going to give it to her in such a mediocre way that it's like, well, that's the worst way to put the cherry on the fucking ice cream to end this uh, storyline. But if it had been done different, do you think the outcome and the perspective would have been better for Becky at one point? Or or are you still sold on the idea that Becky's uh, story is done? I don't think her story is done, but I don't think that the story has gone to, to the climax that it should have gone to. We, we got there. They, we, tur- they turned the stove down. Yeah. Right when we were about to hit that climax, they're like, no, not yet. Or maybe not ever. Like, I don't let's know. pull back. Yeah. Which, which seems to be a big problem of either pulling the trigger too early or too late and never letting something happen when it's just right. So, I mean, again. They're afraid. Yeah. Either they're afraid or they don't want to, part of the pun, they don't want to bank on it. Um, but, again, I you, usually they will find that when you allow for these superstars to just run with it, usually it pans out good. Yeah, there are exceptions here and there where... They give the ball to a superstar and they ask for creative ideas from that superstar and it's maybe not the best in the world. But someone of Becky Lynch's caliber, I think if you, for example, pair her up with Shayna and go, okay, go into a private room, you got 30 minutes, I want you to think. Think of what you guys want to do because their lead up to Mania was entertaining. I enjoyed it. It wasn't satire. It wasn't comedic. It wasn't modest. It was ruthless. It was in your face. And it, once again, I go back to my point of before, when it came time for the match to, to leave that impact, it didn't. And this is the part where it irks me just a little bit, the fact that Rhea Ripley and her opponent at WrestleMania get 25 minutes 
and Becky and Shayna only get eight minutes, it's kind of a head scratcher, if you ask me. Is it a head scratcher because of who it is facing Rhea or because of the circumstance of we don't know what to do with Becky and Shayna? I want to say a little bit of both. Okay, that's fair. I mean, in 2020, if you don't know what to do with Becky or Shayna, you should not be on the creative team. Oh, well, well, there's a lot of people that shouldn't be. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I, we all I, mean, uh, I mean, Vince, I'm pretty sure that one of my old applications is still floating around in your system, so uh, you know where to find me. What's that phone number, Dan? Well, it's uh, 734 and he stands his case. Oh, sorry. I think my phone cut out. Oh, do something, you want? Do you want something to... about a seven? I don't know. Oh, oh, that's weird. I I gotta say, I think the last number that I heard was a night. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. You can catch all your favorite WWE programming only on the WWE Network for a non-negotiable but very reasonable price of just only nine ninety nine. And that, kids, is how you bring it back full circle. Unlike their creative team. So, with that said, uh, any last remarks about the Mount Rushmores or anything else that we talked about here today? Um, I mean, the only thing I'll say is the, the nice thing about uh, a, a giant stone mountain carved into faces is that until you destroy the mountain, it can always be changed. You know, I just thought of something. I had Stone Cold and The Rock on my list, right? You yeah. know, because it's Stone Cold and it's The uh, Rock. Because it's like set in stone. They're in stone, kind of like a rock. And they're right there. It's just their faces. And so you can see it. It's not Ladies moving. and gentlemen, Anything Wrestling Podcast apologizes for horrible puns. On our behalf, we are sorry. You know, that's very offensive, Kamish. We'll get past this. This too shall pass. Unlike Charlotte's entitlement. So, with yeah. that said, guys, thank you so much. This was a very fun episode. To all of our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. And hopefully you've stayed with us throughout... The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you guys let us know in the comments section what would your Mount Rushmore be for both the males and the females? Who would you put in there? Why would you put them in there? Let us know what you guys think. And until next time, stay home, stay safe, and we'll catch you guys all next time.